Hey, we're back uh, with Susan Verstraight, and she's going to share with us um, just a story, quick story, and introduce us to Darlene Rose. Um, and she, I did read her Evidence Not Seen, and I mean, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite biography, just incredible story. So tell us a little bit about Darlene Rose. Well, I'll show you my copy of the book which is very old. <laughs> you can see it's dated. There is one more on eBay I looked in, but, uh, but there's a new edition and I, I would suggest you get the new edition of this. Um, it, um, Darlene Rose's biography has meant um, so much to me over the years. I do read it. I've probably read it six or eight times and I will read it again and again. Um, the, the, the best thing about that biography, and I'll tell you her story a little bit, but the best thing I found about that biography is the lack of self-pity in it. She goes through some really difficult times, and the people around her tell her to be a good soldier. They don't say, oh, honey, I'm so sorry, which there's a place for that. There's a place for having friends that give you sympathy and love in, in these situations, but, um, but, but she was charged with being a good soldier, and she, she, she did it. She she did what she needed to do, and uh, and I think that may be something that that at least I'm lacking. And sometimes my kind, sweet, supportive friends sometimes don't tell me that hard thing that I need to I need to woman up. I need to get through it. I need to trust God and do the hard thing. And I think um, having people say that to me through biographies has been a real blessing. They show me through their example that that. Um, uh, that Christian Christianity isn't always easy. That that I, um, our pastor once said that uh, our circumstances are no indication of God's favor. God can favor us and be there with us and have real blessings for us in the most horrific circumstances. So Darlene Rose was a missionary to New Guinea. It was Dutch New Guinea at the time. I think. It, uh, um, she was born in 1917. She um, uh, married in 1937 and, um, and went to serve in a, such a remote place. It was so far from the beaten path that she had. They had never seen a white person there before, and they'd never seen, a, um, they, were, they were small people. They were, um, uh, I, I, they were little people there. And they had never seen anybody so very tall as her husband when he came to this remote area to serve them. And they had to learn the language and they had to, it, it was it was very isolated. It was so isolated in fact that they thought that the people who lived there, the indigenous people thought that once she went over the mountains, that's where God lived on the other side. So when this big white man came over the mountains, they didn't realize he was a person like them and so, um, so Darlene wasn't allowed to go at first, but when she finally came, she, she came over that mountain, over the side of that mountain, and she said, I am home, I am home. Even though everything was strange and all the people were different, God had given her such a love for the people, and she wanted to tell them the gospel. She wanted to tell them that, that their lives could be changed because Christ died and was raised again. And she wanted to convey that to them. It was the most important thing to her. Well, they served there only a few years when uh, World War II broke out. And at, um, they were taken, um, even they had gone to a bigger city away from their tribe of people uh, because of the uncertainty of war and they didn't know if they would have to um, evacuate or what would happen and they were captured. Um, and so, uh, after a brief time, Darlene and her husband were separated. Uh, she, um, as he was leaving, she saw she was only able to grab a, a pillowcase and put things in it for him. And, um, and he was sitting in the back of a truck and the soldiers were taking him away. And she said, she remembered that when, when she was a little girl, she had prayed, God, I will, do, I will go anywhere you say. Anything you want me to do, I will do. And so when he was driving, they were driving away with him. She says, with greater understanding, I confirm to you anything, Lord. I leave the, co I leave the cost of it to you. And yeah, yeah. She's yeah. Getting, 
Oh, that I would have that heart. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. It, but um, what I was fascinated with when I read her biography the first few times was trying to see, okay, how did God sustain her through the trial? By what means? And if I am in a trial like hers someday, and I, I pray I'm not, but I'll have smaller trials, how will God sustain me? By what means will he sustain me? And the, the first one's pretty easy, through his word. She had a lot of the Bible memorized. And it helped her. He brought, he was able to use that and bring things to her mind as she needed them in, in the night when she was lying in bed and asking questions and being needing comfort. The Lord was able to use verses that she'd already had memorized for that reason or for in that way. The others, um, a great thing about when they did take her to the internment camp, she was in a um, barracks with other believers. And that they prayed in the morning, they prayed together at night, they had a devotional every day, that made a huge difference. So she, they, God used other believers to keep her encouraged during her incarceration. Um, also, um, hymns and poetry. There's, um, she would often, and you, you see this with Johnny Erickson taught it too, that she uses hymns a great deal to keep, the Lord uses them in her life to keep her encouraged and centered on him. There was one time when, um, uh, she was, uh, Darlene Rose was taken to an internment camp uh, that was even worse than the one she was in. She was tortured and questioned and, and she had dysentery and she was uh, not only fed once a day and the food had maggots in it and she had to eat it anyway because she was starving. But just before she left, she memorized this poem by um, Annie Flint and it, 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 it was right there ministering to her the whole time she was in the in this Nazi incarceration, it said, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, to multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. Fear not that thy need shall exceed his provision, our God ever yearns his resources to share. Lean hard on the arm everlasting availing, the Father both thee and thy load will upbear. His love has no limits, his grace has no measure, his power no boundary known to men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Oh, tell me the, the uh, author again, Flint. Annie, Annie Johnson Flint, F-L-I-N-T. It's, it's, it's called He Giveth More Grace, and it's a wonderful poem, but it, it comes to life when you hear her using it to comfort herself in, in affliction, because, um, uh, because it has that memory attached to it as well as, uh, as the beauty of the words and the truth behind them. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, was, that was a fascinating part for me. She had no self-pity, that over and over again, I keep excuse me I keep thinking about how she never she never said oh I'm so hungry and I'm so tired and I really want no she was still serving the people around her she was saying all right you know and that was one of the things she did say over and over again she there would be a crisis and she would say all right Lord it, and really what she was saying was uh was first Peter um five one five and six uh, first peter five or six she was saying i humble myself under your mighty hand that's what she was saying she was going to accept whatever she didn't waste her energy fighting with god about her circumstances she accepted the circumstances that god gave because she understand that she understood the provision of his love that everything she went through was for a greater purpose. Just like when we, uh, when we talked earlier about how all the biographies fit together, everything that happened to Darlene Rose fit together in God's providence to make her who she was, to minister to countless people through her book. And when she, when she returned home, and she got off the boat. I'm sorry, I'm going in a direction. But when she got home, she got off the boat, and she met a little girl who was, a, she wasn't a little girl at the time, she was a teenager, but she was an orphan that um, uh, had grown up um, uh, in foster care, terrible abuse. But uh, Dory Van Stone heard her speak and she heard her say, Jesus for you, I would do it all again. 
after all the horrific things she had went, she had gone through, she went to meet Darlene Rose and talk to her after this event. And her, Darlene Rose's parents, in a sense, adopted Dory Van Stone. They brought her into their home. They let her go to school. In, uh, and she became a missionary who followed Darlene Rose to the field, to the same place in New Guinea where Darlene and her new husband served. It was a fascinating story. I, uh, the way that God wove those together. It, yes. Uh, so so the, other, the other two ways that he says, well, three ways that I think are important that God sustained her through prayer. Um, she had a back and forth with God all day long, every day. It wasn't just a, here, I'm going to pray for 30 minutes in the morning. It was a constant, she was constantly in prayer and God was real. He was right there. He was guiding her because she kept her mind fixed on him. You see what you, that's, that's, I think that's part of it. If you aren't thinking about God, you don't see God. He can be doing kind things for you and you can miss it because you aren't thinking in a spiritual way. She kept her mind fixed on him and then she could see the kindnesses that he was giving her and the ways he was sustaining her. The other thing I think was important was that she took every thought captive. She talks about the spiritually unprofitable game of suppose. And I love that, that uh, terminology. Again. The spiritually unprofitable game of suppose. And so she would lay in her bed and she would say, suppose mother and father are no longer alive. Suppose uh, we never get out of this camp. Suppose the United States loses the war. And then she had to rein herself in and stop playing that game. And I need to rein myself in and stop playing that game. It is deadly to your soul. Um, you, you go through all the emotions of all those tragedies and they never happen. And so, uh, so her example to me was good in that. And that is that phrase, that spiritually unprofitable game of suppose is in my mind now. And it's a warning flag. I, uh, but anyway, uh, Darlene, we're going to post a link to Darlene telling her own story. And I encourage you to listen to that first. And then when you read her book, you'll hear her voice in your head. And, and it'll be as if your friend is talking to you, just like we're talking together. It'll, you'll hear her read her story to you. And there are different stories in the book and in the audio. So I, I do encourage you to do both. But if you, um, I, I, I don't know how else to describe how wonderful this biography. Everybody I know has read it. We have a little catchphrase with some of my friends. When, when it's too hard to tell someone that they need to man up, we say, what would Darlene Rose do? Mm -hmm. And that's a way of saying, okay, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Pat, let's do what the next thing is that the Lord has described for us. So I hope you love her as much as I do. I, I've enjoyed reading that biography over and over. And tell us again the title. Evidence Not Seen, and it's uh, one woman's miraculous faith uh, in Japanese prison during World War II. Well, thanks, Susan. And thanks, Sarah. What do you think the next one will be? That uh, the Devil Who Baked Virginia Tea Cakes, and that's the story of Lottie Moon. Okay. Yay. <laughs> All right. We'll see you again. Okay. Bye-bye.